Hey, what's going on everybody? Today, we'll be working with Firewall D for the RHCSA. Now, when it comes to exam objectives, we have this one called Restrict Network Access using Firewall CMD slash Firewall, and then the second one down here under Manage Security called Configure Firewall Settings using Firewall CMD slash Firewall D. Okay, now I don't know about you, but I find these objectives to be pretty vague on their own. So let's try to unpack what they're actually asking us to practice here. All right. So this first objective about restricting network access using the firewall had me thinking about what are some of the ways that we can do this so-called restricting that they're talking about. Uh, I mean, that's really the important part. So here are just some of the ways that we could handle that. First of all, we're going to want to make sure that the firewall is actually enabled and actively running, because if it isn't up, then there will be nothing in place to restrict the network traffic. Next up, we're going to want to do some cleanup and take a look at the ports and services that are currently open, and close off any that we don't actually need. Now, a good example of a service that we probably would want to keep allowed is SSH, but there could be other services that are unnecessary. Another thing is that if we identify any specific IP addresses or networks that we don't want connecting inbound, uh, we can go ahead and block them. And uh, here's another bit. Uh, Firewall D assigns incoming traffic to a default zone, which is usually the public zone. So that'll happen if the traffic doesn't match any other rules that we've set. So it's kind of like a catch-all thing. However, uh, we can change this default zone to something else so that traffic that we didn't explicitly call out with our rules can still be restricted to a more appropriate zone. Firewall D also allows you to assign specific network interfaces to different zones, so we can use that to create more fine-grained rules for different types of traffic. Now, I might talk about this a little bit more in depth, how it can be used in practice. Uh, we'll, we'll just have to see. But yeah, uh, finally, uh, we can use Firewall D to block ICMP traffic, which is often used for diagnostic purposes. It can be useful, but it also could be used to launch attacks against our system. So blocking it could be a good idea, uh, depending on your needs. Yeah, so uh, these are just some of the things that came to my mind when it comes to restricting network access. But now, uh, to actually apply these ideas, we have the second objective about configuring the firewall settings. So there are a lot of ways to do that, but I'll just show you a general list of options that I've compiled together uh, that you could give to the firewall-cmd command in case you uh, want to just like write them down or practice with them individually. So yeah, here they are. And uh, I also am leaving like a bonus thing at the end. Uh, maybe we will get to that maybe in a future video. It, it's all just a matter of uh, what happens. Yeah, cool. Now, I would also like to quickly recap what our lab network looks like. So we have some kind of device for link layer connectivity. For simplicity, let's just call it a switch. And then we have a couple of machines connected to that switch. Now, one of these machines is actually very special. It has a secondary interface, which is connected to what is effectively the internet. That's what we'll just say for sake of example. And this machine also takes care of some useful services for this network, like DHCP, DNS, IP forwarding, and NAT routing, which is what allows the other machines to communicate with the internet through this particular machine as a gateway. Fun fact, this NAT or traffic masquerading is actually handled by Firewall D. And this machine uses the internal and external zones in Firewall D to organize its different network interfaces. So I just thought that was pretty cool. But anyways, thanks to the DHCP and DNS services, the other machines on the network can get automatic IP assignments and also can resolve each other's IP via DNS host names. And the DHCP lease for these particular machines have been configured to be infinite, by the way. So uh, these IP assignments won't change anytime soon either. So as you can see, based on the host names, we have a workstation oriented machine, and then we have some general purpose server machines. Uh, we'll just focus on configuring these servers in particular. I uh, just wanted to point that out. But yeah, finally, uh, let's not forget that all of these machines are running a host based firewall, which is of course going to be firewall D. And yeah, there we go. That's the network topology right there in a nutshell. And I hope the visuals helped grasp our situation here. 
I just felt like trying out something kind of professional for this video. But uh, yeah, what we'll do now is actually work on our server machines. All right, I'm logged in as root on all three of my app server machines. That's good. And what we'll do now is just make sure that firewall D is correctly enabled. So allow me to just cut to the chase. I can already tell you that app servers two and three are working just fine. It's really just gonna be app server one where the firewall D service is masked and disabled right now. See, if I run a firewall dash CMD double dash state, we can see that it's not running, it's a no go. However, if I do the same thing on app server two, firewall dash CMD double dash state, we can see that it is running. So there's a bit of a comparison for you. This is what we want to see. We want to see it running. Uh, for some other details, we can also check system CTL status firewall D. And right now we can see that it's masked and inactive. That's what's going on with the service. So we can go ahead and unmask the systemd service with systemctl unmask firewall D. And there we go, it's unmasked. And next we can just go and enable and start firewall D with systemctl enable double dash now firewall D. So that double dash now is gonna make sure to start the service right away. And we can do that. And now if I check the status, uh, there we go. It's active, running, loaded, all good stuff. So there we go, uh, now it's running. I can just clear the screen and let's go and hop over to App Server 2 again and we'll do a couple of uh, insights on what's going on with our firewall. So you'll see here that if I run a firewall-cmd double dash list all, uh, we can get a general picture of what's going on with our current active default zone. So that's gonna be the public zone and uh, so we can also check on these individual things, like I'll just show you uh, double dash get um, default zone. This is gonna show us what our default zone is. Uh, we can also do double dash get active zones, I think. Yeah, get active zones. And there we go, uh, public is the only active zone because it has an interface assigned to it. And uh, so in terms of other commands that I'd like to show you, uh, we can also do double dash uh, list services and there we go those are the services that are enabled in our default zone because we didn't specify a zone that's what that's what's going on here and uh, similarly we can also do a list ports and there are some ports that are uh, enabled in our default zone so i mean uh, this dash dash list all thing up here is basically going to have you covered for a lot of information that you might want to check but uh, just in case, you can check on these individual things just like just like I showed you right here. Okay, so uh, yeah, anyways, uh, you've probably already noticed that we have these unusual services and ports enabled right here. And so uh, we have like Bitcoin, uh, SMTP, POP3, Synergy, Telnet, VNC Server, Cockpit, SSH, like... It, it, it's no surprise that some of these services, at least, are uh, not exactly relevant for this machine. So uh, we can get rid of these services with firewall-cmd-remove-service equals, and then we can do some brace expansion here and get rid of some, like Bitcoin, comma, POP3, comma, SMTP, and uh, what else? Telnet, we don't need that. A VNC server. Uh, what else? Synergy. And I guess we can get rid of cockpit as well. I don't really use cockpit on this machine. And so I'll just run that and it'll remove those services. There we go. Now, obvious warning, if your machine is supposed to host a service or you were never asked to tamper with what services are allowed, then you're probably not going to want to remove its firewall exception. You know, that's pretty obvious, but I just wanted to put that out there. And like I said earlier, uh, you would probably want to keep SSH around. So if I do that list all again, I think that's the easiest command to go with. You can see here that I left SSH alone. Uh, I also left DHCP v6 client alone. Uh, just so happens that that's what I did. Um, but also, let's go ahead and also get rid of some of these ports as well. So uh, we can do that with good old brace expansion again. Uh, firewall dash CMD dash dash remove port equals and then some braces 
101 slash TCP, 202 slash UDP, uh, 303 slash TCP, and 404 slash UDP. There we go. So those got rid of as well. And now if I check this again, uh, we can see that our ports are squeaky clean. Okay, so uh, cool. Now, let me give an example where we might want to actually remove the SSH service because I'm kind of acting like it's like really important that we always keep it around. Well, um, if I go back over to app server one and do a firewall dash CMD dash dash list all, you can see here that I have SSH allowed, but I also have port 2222 slash TCP allowed. So guess what? Um, my SSH daemon on app server one actually listens on port 2222. Uh, on this particular machine. So uh, this additional SSH service is actually just collecting dust, doing basically nothing useful. So we can actually remove it with no problem. Uh, in this case, we won't get locked out. So uh, firewall uh, cmd dash dash remove service SSH, and now it's gone. And you know what? Uh, these changes have not taken effect permanently. So uh, one way to take care of that is to actually do a uh, well, let me show you that it's taking effect in the runtime configuration at least and there you go We can also remove cockpit. Why not? Just wanted to do that as well But yeah, so uh, this is the runtime configuration and we can go and turn this into the permanent configuration and the persistent configuration with firewall dash cmd dash dash runtime to uh, permanent just like that and there we go. So now uh, I can do a list all and it's fine, but I can also do a double dash reload and we should be able to see exactly the same thing. And there we go. And uh, we should also probably do this on app server two as well. We didn't give a permanent option here. So I should probably run a firewall dash CMD dash dash run time to permanent, just like so. There we go. And uh, now I can just do a reload and we should be able to see the same thing. So there we go. That's all good. Cool. So um, another thing I guess I can show you as well is how to get the services or how to add a service to um, the firewall. So I, I guess I'll do that on this machine over here, App Server 1. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and add the, uh, well, let's check what services we can add. So firewall dash cmd dash dash get services. And uh, oh, there's a bunch of them. But uh, maybe I'm interested in ones that have to do with HTTP, maybe. So uh, let's go ahead and add HTTP and HTTPS services to this zone. Why not? So we can do that with uh, firewall dash cmd dash dash add service this time. And then some brace expansion HTTP https and now uh, actually let me do that in the permanent configuration so dash dash permanent and uh, now if I do a firewall dash cmd double dash reload and, and then check list all we can see that it took effect just fine so um, doing the double dash permanent thing is uh, pretty useful uh, you don't have to keep doing runtime to permanent all you have to do is just remember to add this option to your commands. So just keep that in mind. Uh, whatever way you like to do it, just stay on top of it. And so uh, maybe uh, I guess another thing that I could do is show you how to add a port since uh, all we did was remove ports so far. So maybe this machine is going to be like a web server testing thing, uh, I guess. So maybe we might want to add port 8080 as well. So we can do that. Uh, firewall dash cmd dash dash add port and then equals add port equals 8080 slash TCP. And there we go, now that port's added. And we can also do that in the permanent configuration. You can see that I'm forgetting that. And so if I do a reload and a list all, there we go, it's right there, it's all good. Cool, I'll just go ahead and clear the screen now. And there we go, I'll also clear this screen. And now let's do something else. Say that we wanted to block or even ignore any connections coming from App Server 3 over here. So, I mean, that sounds kind of rude, but there are legitimate reasons why you might want to block an incoming IP. So, no problem. We can take care of that. 
we'll just go back over to app server one and run a firewall dash cmd dash dash zone equals block and then add a source address with dash dash add source equals and then provide the IP address of app server three. So that's going to be 10.0.0.13. And if I run this, it's going to make all of the traffic from the source address 10.0.0.13 get handled by the block zone. And here's just another side note. Uh, you can block an entire network by just giving the CIDR notation of it. So like I could do something like this and that would block that entire network. I'm not going to do that actually, but I just wanted to show you that. Um, and also take note that I did not do this in the permanent configuration, so it's not going to persist. So yeah. Um, anyways, uh, if I do a firewall dash cmd dash dash list all on the block zone, so zone equals block, you'll see here that the source address has been added to this zone. And in terms of other things, you can see here that uh, there are no services or ports open or allowed for this zone. So that means that if I tried to do something like SSH um, from app server three to app server one, it's just not going to work because the source address is going to get handled by the block zone and the block zone does not allow port 2222. So I can just demonstrate that. Um, I'll go over here and just do an SSH port 2222 app server one, and we're not going to be allowed. However, if I go over to app server two and do the same thing, SSH port 2222 app server one, it will work. So yeah. Um, another thing is that if I do a ping uh, app server one, uh, we're going to get a bunch of packet filtered errors. So I believe this is because uh, the uh, block zone uh, will reject traffic with a ICMP error. So uh, that's probably where that's coming from. Uh, anyways, so if I go back over here, uh, I just want to show you, uh, I can reload the configuration to get rid of that add source setting really quick. So I can do a reload just like that. And there we go. So now if I go back over here and try to do like an SSH again, it will work. And ping is also going to work as well. So there we go. Um, now, uh, so instead of doing a, uh, add source to the block zone, uh, I'm going to do an add source to the drop zone. So I just want to show you the difference between these two zones can, cause they sound like a little bit, uh, similar to each other, but they do have a distinct difference. The drop zone is going to completely ignore the traffic while block only rejects it with a special error message. And also I'm going to also do this in the permanent configuration. There we go. And that means that I'm going to need to reload again. And so, yeah, I'm going to go back over to app server three and try to do something like a ping. And I'm going to get basically silence because uh, it's going to straight up ignore the traffic from this IP address. Same thing with SSH. So, yeah. So I would say that the drop zone is a lot stricter and the less trusting of the two uh, between block and drop. And uh, also just for completeness, let me just show you how to remove the source rule. Uh, so it's a permanent rule. So I can just go back up here and edit this line and just change add to remove just like that. And everything else can stay the same. And it's going to remove it from uh, the uh, permanent configuration. So I can do a reload. And now everything should be pretty much back to normal. So I can ping, that works. SSH, that works as well. Cool. I think that's going to be enough for this video. In the second part, we're going to focus a lot more on zones and assigning interfaces to them to make them active and stuff. We might also work on blocking ICMP traffic a little bit more. So uh, stay tuned for that. But as always, I hope this video was helpful for you, and thanks for watching.